kitchen computer handles the details. Moves frozen dishes into the oven without defrosting. This will call for special cookware made of space-age ceramic. She has a whole set to use for cooking, mixing, and preparing all kinds of dishes. Incredibly hard and smooth, it quickly washes sparkling white, inspires creative touches in the meal she prepares. And because this remarkable cookware is actually Corningware, freeze, cook, serve ware. It goes proudly to the table. Beautiful Corningware work savers. The cookware of tomorrow. And yet, any of these pieces can be yours today. Get started on a Corningware set now. Get a head start on the future. No city of today will serve as the guide for the city of tomorrow. Epcot will be a planned environment, demonstrating to the world what American communities can accomplish through proper control of planning and design. Epcot begins with an idea new among cities built since the birth of the automobile. We call it the radio plan. Picture a wheel. Like the spokes of the wheel, the city fans out along a series of radials from a bustling hub at the center of Epcot. A network of transportation systems radiate from the central hub, carrying people to and from the heart of the city. These transportation systems circulate to and through four primary spheres of activity surrounding the central core. First, the area of business and commerce. Next, the high-density apartment housing. Then the broad green belt and recreation lands. Finally, the low-density, neighborhood, residential streets. Epcot's dynamic urban center will offer the excitement and variety of activities found only in metropolitan cities, cultural, social, business, and entertainment. Among its major features will be a cosmopolitan hotel and convention center, towering 30 or more stories, shopping areas, where stores and whole streets recreate the character and adventure of places around the world. Theaters for dramatic and musical productions. Restaurants and a variety of nightlife attractions. And a wide range of office buildings, some containing services required by Epcot's residents, but most of them designed especially to suit the local and regional needs of major corporations. But most important, this entire 50 acres of city streets and buildings will be completely enclosed. In this climate-controlled environment, shoppers and theater-goers and people just out for a stroll will enjoy ideal weather conditions, protected day and night from rain, heat and cold, and humidity. Here, the pedestrian will be king free to walk and browse without fear of motorized vehicles. Only electric-powered vehicles will travel above the streets of Epcot's central city. This towering hotel is the visual center of Epcot, the shining jewel at the center of the city. It will offer tourists and vacationers not only the most modern guest rooms and convention facilities, but also a seven-acre recreation deck located high above the pedestrian and shopping areas of the city. But hidden from view, directly beneath the hotel, is another kind of vital center, Epcot's transportation lobby. Although out of sight to hotel guests, this transportation terminal will play a key role in the city of tomorrow's ability to meet the needs of both visitor and resident. Two separate but interconnecting transit systems will move people into and out of Epcot in speed, safety, and comfort through this central terminal. Both are electrically powered. The high-speed monorail for rapid transit over longer distances, and a concept new to the American city for shorter travel distances, the Wedway People Mover. Automobiles and trucks will not be barred from Epcot. In fact, a vast armada of vehicles will continuously flow through the heart of the community, traveling below the pedestrian level 
on roadways reserved for specific types of vehicles. Let's look at another view of Epcot's transportation hub and see how traffic flows through the heart of the city on three separate levels. At the bottom of the stack is the truck route, reserved for supply vehicles. Trucks will have easy access to all loading docks and service elevators for the delivery of commercial goods. The middle level is the automobile throughway, exclusively for cars. Adjacent to the roadway are parking areas for the convenience of hotel guests. For the motorist just driving through, no stoplight will ever slow the constant flow of traffic through the center of Epcot. But automobiles and freeways will not be Epcot's major way of entering and leaving the city. The transportation heartbeat of Epcot will be the two electric powered systems, monorail and wedway, that radiate to and from the transportation lobby. And the key system in this coordinated network will be the Wedway People Mover. The first People Mover installation is already in daily operation at Disneyland. On peak days, it carries nearly 40,000 passengers. The cars you see here are approximately 5 8 scale, considerably smaller than full-size passenger cars would be for city use. Epcot's People Mover is a silent, all-electric system that never stops running. continue to move even while passengers are disembarking or stepping aboard. Power is supplied from a series of motors embedded in the track, completely independent of the cars. No single car can ever break down and cause a rush hour traffic jam in Epcot. Because the cars run continuously, there will be no waiting in stations for a Wedway people mover. The next car is always ready. Now let's go back to the transportation lobby and see how the Wedway will travel along one radial between the center of Epcot and a typical residential area. Leaving the transportation lobby, the Wedway trains travel above the downtown streets. In minutes, the Wedway passes through the first station. Many people who work in the offices and stores of Epcot City Center board the Wedway here for their trip home. Some people leave the Wedway here too. They live in Epcot's high density apartments surrounding the Metropolitan Center. Most passengers who ride the Wedway live beyond the apartments and stay aboard the People Mover as it crosses Epcot's sheltering Greenbelt. Epcot's Green Belt is more than just a broad expanse of beautiful lawns and walks and trees. Here too are the community's varied recreational facilities, its playgrounds for children, its churches, and its schools. Beyond the Green Belt are Epcot's neighborhood areas of single-family homes. This is one radial neighborhood. Here and throughout the community, residents returning from work or shopping will disembark from the Wedway at stations located conveniently just a few steps from where they live. The homes are located in a wide green area that provides light recreation activities for adults and play areas for children. Circulating through this area are footpaths reserved for pedestrians, electric carts, and bicycles. Children going to and from schools and playgrounds will use these paths always completely safe and separated from the automobile. The resident leaving home in his automobile will drive down a street reserved for motor vehicles. He then enters a one-way road that circles the city center. This road carries the motorist onto the main throughway connecting Epcot with other points in Disney World and with Florida's nearby network of major highways. But most Epcot residents will drive their automobiles only on weekend pleasure trips. From all over the community, residents going to their jobs converge by Wedway on the center city. Many work downtown in offices, stores, and shops. 
But most employees go beyond the city core to their jobs. From the transportation lobby, monorail trains carry employees either to the theme park or to Epcot's 1,000-acre industrial park. At this central station in the industrial complex, passengers disembark from the monorail and again board Wedway cars that radiate to each facility. This industrial complex will provide employment for many people who live in Epcot. But it will mean much more, not only for this community, but also for American industry. Here, the Disney staff will work with individual companies to create a showcase of industry at work. In attractive park-like settings, the six million people who visit Disney World each year will look behind the scenes at experimental prototype plants, research and development laboratories, and computer centers for major corporations. So this is Epcot, the heart of Disney World. In other parts of the country, a community the size of this prototype could become part of an entire city complex composed of many such communities, planned and built a few miles apart. In Disney World, about 20,000 people will actually live in Epcot. Their homes will be built in ways that permit ease of change so that new products may continuously be demonstrated. Their schools will welcome new ideas so that everyone who grows up in Epcot will have skills in pace with today's world. Epcot will be a working community with employment for all. And everyone who lives here will have a responsibility to help keep this community an exciting, living blueprint of the future. And now here again is Walt Disney. That's the starting point for our experimental prototype community of tomorrow. And now, where do we go from these preliminary plans and sketches? Well, a project like this is so vast in scope that no one company alone can make it a reality. But if we can bring together the technical know-how of American industry and the creative imagination of the Disney organization, I'm confident we can create right here in Disney World a showcase to the world of the American free enterprise system. I believe we can build a community that more people will talk about and come to look at than any other area in the world. And with your cooperation, I'm sure this experimental prototype community of tomorrow can influence the future of city living for generations to come. You're watching Sleep Corps, Pleasant Dreams. Please answer me, over. Oh, my God. as best we can. Delaware, make a careful check on our position and try to contact Brinkman again. 
Acceleration rockets. Thrust. 18, 21, 24, 27, 30. underground. You're on. Get the crawlers out of the way, or the next time the voltage mounts, exactly the same thing will us. Tension line over there. <laughs> now, your machine blew up just because you landed right on top of that surface power line. All we have to do is to follow it, and it will probably lead us to the inhabitants of Venus. There's no point in trying to do that. I've already found the inhabitants of Venus, and I've brought one of them back for you. What is it? I wonder if it is a form of life. I'll investigate at once. All right, Chen Yu. And while he's doing that, let's go and try to follow that line. Okay. Amagan, come on. Crawler, please come in. Crawler, please come in. We're following the power line. Something very strange here. A white sphere that looks like a, an immense golf ball. It's incredible. You think it's a machine, Olaf? Well, I can't say yet. I don't know. Everything here is so strange. It's as if we were trying to decipher a book in an unknown language. Let's hope that soon we'll be able to read it. And perhaps we'll understand. Olaf, let me know when you've got your instruments ready. Now I'll need all the figures I can get. Okay, Sakara. Good. Thank you. Hello, stay in close contact with us. Very well, Professor. I am looking at Venus on the observation screen of the Cosmos Trader. Everything is strangely quiet. Is this the calm before the storm? Why don't the Venusians answer? Or are these metallic insects really the masters of this planet? Chen Yu is working day and night to solve the mystery of these strange creatures. The research program is going according to plan. We are all fascinated by the vitrified forest. 
but our spacesuits are so heavy that working outside the ship is difficult. The investigation of the power lines leading to the white sphere and measurement of tension changes is done by oscillograph. The storms which whip across Venus only make the work harder. That's where the lines lead to, all right. There's no doubt. That's it. Chen Yu was collecting samples of the sand carried by the storm. Sometimes they are radioactive, sometimes they are not. He is searching for traces of life. The long Venusian night is always preceded by a violent storm. Then the outside work must stop, and we spend our time studying what we have found so far. Do you think this vitrified forest is a biological formation? Why not? It could come from a dried up seabed. You're wrong. It's not a natural formation. Professor Sikana has been feeding figures and data into the electronic brain and he now has some conclusions. He says that the vitrified forest is an enormous energy projector capable of destroying all life within a radius of millions of miles. Then it was built by the inhabitants of Venus. Yes. This vitrified forest was made to be a weapon of aggression. But then something went unexpectedly wrong. Perhaps they decided to disarm. <laughs> I'm afraid it was more serious than that. The metal insects you found for us shows something very significant. That's very interesting. Go on, tell us more, Professor Sakarna. I do not yet have all the facts, but I think that a terrible catastrophe took place on Venus. I reach a certain stage, and I can't get any further. It's chaotic. It's like, it's like everything was broken. Now, if there really was a catastrophe, which changed the face of the whole planet, then it was so huge a catastrophe as to be absolutely beyond our powers of comprehension. Shall we keep going? Yes. following us and watch out. What's that? I don't know. They're not natural forms. They must have been buildings of some sort. been as high a temperature here as on the sun. And every living thing was destroyed by an incredible catastrophe. You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. America stands on the threshold of its third century, powered by the scientific revolution. Technology has thrust us into a new age of machines, the age of the computer, extending our minds and our ability to communicate the way earlier machines extended our reach and muscles. Machines in the past often threatened our sense of identity and our faith that we, not the machines, are more important. The computer intensifies that basic concern, 
How do we free our hands and minds without enslaving our spirits? In what ways can science and technology help us? These questions lie at the heart of this program, and indeed they are the basis of this series. Our story, On the Side of Man. Not all our dreams about machines have been pleasant. We stand in awe of Yankee ingenuity and ask what will they think of next. But there is also the myth of the mad scientist turning the powers of the machine toward the creation of a dehumanized world. Half a century ago, the German film Metropolis envisioned a world where men had been enslaved by the machines they created. Metropolis was science fiction, but to many surrounded by new machines, it touched a real fear and the concern seemed confirmed as assembly line technology spread. How do we design machines that work on the side of man, not against him? Machines that extend freedom, not limit it. Not what can the machine do, but what do we want it to do? The more powerful the machine, the more important these questions become. The conquest of the moon would have been impossible without the computer, a powerful new technological tool. It's relatively easy for us to accept the mechanical might of a machine like the Saturn V rocket. But the computer is a different kind of machine. Until its advent, man's ability to conceive and communicate ideas and information was unique. Now we are beginning to share some of that ability with this machine. The men and women who work with computers at institutions like MIT do not regard this new relationship as a matter of competition. They see the computer as the basis for a more profound man-machine partnership. But how near is this goal? To make machines more adaptable to humans, we must understand more about how people behave. What happens, for example, when we speak? Can we give the computer this most common means of communication? Let me say a few words about today's computer. Let me say a few words about today's computer. Let me say a few words about today's computer. I do not understand. This is a computer talking. Let us now say a few words about today's computers. They are just learning to talk like a child sounding out words, but their potential is almost unlimited. Given is definitely wrong. Uh, wonder if that's a definition problem. It could be, given, 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 it could be too long. At Bell Laboratories, Cecil Coker and Noriko Yumeda are trying to perfect this talking computer. By using an animated diagram of the human vocal tract and studying how it shapes words, they are learning to understand and correct the machine's pronunciation. All of the sounds in this machine are defined in terms of vocal tract shapes. And we use the picture to define the sounds. And when it misarticulates something, uh, we go back to this picture to see, hopefully, what it did wrong and how it mispronounced it. This is the nose, lips, and chin. Vocal cords are down here. This is the body of the tongue. And at the moment, the tongue tip is touching the roof of the mouth somewhere behind the teeth. Slowing down the speech and the vocal tract picture makes the analysis of mistakes easier. Z is a tongue tip right behind the teeth. It's groaning through the utterance, I can read stories and speak them aloud now in real time. I can read stories and speak them aloud. Let me say a few words about today's computer. With the ability to speak, we are one step closer to a computer that will talk to us rather than just type. Now what about sight? What if a computer could see? 
could look at the world and understand what it sees just as we do. At MIT, a television camera scans a picture of magnified blood cells, feeding the patterns of light and dark it sees to a computer. The computer has been taught to use as visual information to identify and measure cells, a job that now has to be done by a trained laboratory technician. With a sense of vision, a computer becomes a far more flexible partner for man. But all of the attempts we've seen to give a machine human-like abilities are far from complete, and they deepen the respect of computer scientists for the complexity of man. Dr. Ted Young. The problem with trying to build machines that see things or hear things or respond to human orders is that, first of all, we, we really don't understand how humans perform these tasks. We perform psychological experiments. We build equipment that we think mimics how humans do it, and then we find out that the equipment is uh, at best idiotic compared to how well humans do it. And we uh, conclude, for the, therefore, that uh, this is a very, very difficult problem. The advantage is, is that once you have solved the task and you have taught a machine how to do these things, the machine can proceed to do them faster and with better uh, numerical precision than the human can. Looking toward the ideal computers of the future, what are the best ways for them to communicate with human partners? Not for the sake of the machine, but rather for man. The work of Professor Alphonse Chopanis and his students at Johns Hopkins studies the human side of man-computer communication. In this experiment, one student plays the part of the ultimate computer of the future. Here it supplies information to build a simple cart. A second student asks for the information he needs to put the cart together. The goal is to discover how different means of man-machine communication help or hinder the exchange of information. As the cart is constructed, starting with an axle, the means of communication can be changed. Okay, at this point, you'll be able to see him on the monitor, and you'll be, you'll be able to talk to him. He will write his messages to you. Today, you must communicate with most computers by typing. But many of us may not want to give up handwriting, a very human kind of communication, just because computers are limited to typing. If we could jot down notes to a computer, would communication be more effective? This experiment also seeks to determine when talking helps the exchange of information. The axle through some three-eighths inch holes in uh, a couple of W-shaped frames. Those the outer frames. Although it's not always essential to see to have efficient communication, it can save time. Here the student is confused when he is told to find a W-shaped frame. With the ability to see, the student playing the computer can correct his mistake more easily. Let me see it on the screen, Jerry. Can you back off a little bit further? Oh, turn it upside down. There. This experiment can't help scientists design more intelligent machines, but it can give us a clearer understanding of what people want machines to do as we work toward a truer, more creative man-computer partnership. Where's Big Turtle? Hurry! Uh, we we should should little turtle. These youngsters are part of a special MIT project called LOGO. As computer scientists learn to teach machines to behave in more human-like ways, they are discovering more about human learning and thinking. This new knowledge from computers can contribute to a new kind of education for children. A computer is a perfect tool for teaching mathematics, for example. As the kids direct a robot turtle to draw geometric shapes, they must have a clear idea of how to use line, distance, and angle to construct what they want. The computer provides them with a new world, Mathland, a place where mathematical concepts can be used to do real things. Now I'm telling it to do it. Oh, no. Sometimes I get into bugs like this. When it was doing it in his mind, the little turtle, it's the little triangle thing, um, was on an angle, so it drew the picture on, on an angle. 
So now I'll go back and have it draw it in its mind again while it's in the right position. This is like the way I taught myself to get it across the screen. The way I had the little one to go is every time it moves up a little, it subtracts a number, a little bit of a number, and then until it, it's a small number. And when it's a certain number, I tell it that it should stop. For the child, this computing machine has, in many, many cases, given a first taste for the beauty and joy of mathematical thinking, a first taste of math power. This is a creative partnership between man and machine. Making the machine perform better helps man learn more about himself and his world. But a truly rewarding man-computer partnership will take time and experience. Terry Winograd. Certainly computers are one area where there's been a tremendous amount of what you might call mystification. Uh, people tend to project an image. Uh, this is true of people who work in the field as well as others who take advantage of it an image of the thinking machine or the infallible computer or all sorts of images which are wrong which aren't the aren't which have very little to do with reality but of course the reality grows out of the fact that people tend to believe that and i think it's important to uh, be aware that people have those kinds of feelings but also to be aware that there isn't this necessary element of sort of competition as to as who thinks better or something there was um to make an analogy there was a, lo a feeling among some people that when the camera was invented that it would be the end of art, that the, the camera could reproduce more faithfully, uh, this machine could reproduce more faithfully on its paper than an artist could, uh, a particular scene, and that it would sort of remove the human from that. And of course, that's very silly. I mean, not only did it not end art, but the camera itself became a tool which enabled people to be more creative. The using the technology, using the camera, gave them new ways of expressing themselves. Will the computer, like the camera, enable man to reach new creative heights and new freedom, with technology working on the side of man? The computer symbolizes both the promise and problems we face in our complex man-machine world. Its misuse by large institutions irritates us. Its misuse by government could threaten us. But its potential for extending our ability to communicate and our knowledge of ourselves is enormous. If it is made relatively easy for anyone to use, the chances are far greater that it will be used on the side of man. No longer can we ask, what can we do? But rather, how can what we do give us a better world?